Welcome everyone. I'm Bill Hopkins, representing the Native Plant Society of Texas. Today we have with us Megan Peoples, who will talk with us about ecoregions and ecology of North Central Texas. Uh, as I said already, Megan is the incoming Vice President for Chapter Liaison for the Native Plant Society of Texas. She uh, has a, a certification as a Master Naturalist from the North Dallas chapter and is now a member of the Prairie Oaks chapter. And she served as president of the East Dallas chapter of the Native Plant Society in the past. And uh, she has received a Bachelor of Science in Horticulture from Texas A&M University, uh, where she was also involved as the president of the Horticulture Club. And it says you, that you placed first nationally on the collegiate plant identification team. Wow, that's quite an achievement. That's really... Oh, thanks. And after graduating, she worked for the Houston Museum of Natural Science. She worked for the Texas Discovery Gardens and also for the AgriLife Research Center in Dallas. And she, uh, a grant with the National Fish and Wildlife Federation presented an opportunity to restore 90 acres of Dallas public parkland back to thriving Blackland Prairie ecosystem and inspired her to return back to school where she's now earning a master's degree at Tarleton State. So welcome. Again, we're looking forward to your presentation. So um, this is my presentation on the ecoregions and ecology of North Central Texas. Um, so as I am talking, go ahead, feel free and chat with me, uh, talk, shout out any questions you might have or comments. I know a lot of people in this community have been in this region for so much longer than I have. Um, so I really value your input and anything that you guys have to add. Um, I'm Megan Peoples. My background is in mostly horticulture, but I've recently, in the last five years, really started specializing in native plants and their ecological interactions. I've experienced doing restoration, like Bill mentioned, in um, Dallas in the park system, uh, as well as with the AgriLife Research Center. Um, and now I'm at Charlton State studying ecology and getting my master's uh, working in grassland restoration and, and environmental restoration work. So I love this presentation because I think it's really important that we all kind of seek an ecological context of what's going on around us. So I'm going to focus on some of the really big picture factors that shaped the environment. Um, as well as the creation of adapted communities and plants and species. So, th and then also share some great insights into how to become better managers of this land and how to participate better in conservation efforts. So hold on, let me move this a little so I can see. Hey, Bill, will you let me know if anyone chats because I can't see all these things at once. I, I will do that. Okay, cool. So what is an ecoregion? To me, a major, uh, an ecoregion is really a major ecosystem. It is distinct from surrounding territories and the factors that shape its landscape. And these are gonna end up influencing the habitat and the species diversity that you're gonna see there. So as you guys can see, um, Texas, as far as a macro kind of ecoregion goes, is really part of the Great, Plan the Great Plains and also the Southeastern deciduous forest. In Texas, we have 10 unique ecoregions, which I'm sure you guys are mostly familiar with, hopefully. Um, this is, and in our area of Texas, what we're really gonna be focusing on here is the black prairie, as well as the cross timbers, um, number four and number five on this map. So let me move this a little. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the big green book, the illustrated flora of North Central Texas. Um, this book was given to me by Sam Kishnick um, and I absolutely love it, but it really breaks up the area of North Central Texas into um, major vegetational areas. So in the cross timbers and prairies, we, are, we have the Blackland Prairie represented here in blue. Um, the cross timbers are going to be broken up into the eastern and western cross timbers. And those are gonna be separated by the Grand Prairie. Grand Prairie is composed of the Fort Worth Prairie and the Lampasas Cup Plain. 
And then the Red River area is also included, which is a distinct kind of vegetational zone along the Red River of Texas on the Oklahoma border. So today we're most gonna be focusing, like I mentioned, on the cross timbers and prairies, um, as well as the Blackland Prairie. So the cross timbers were very distinct to settlers coming from uh, Eastern states into the West. Um, as two distinct bands of timber line. Uh, so coming back to this map, Eastern cross timbers and Western cross timbers were broken up by prairie um, on either side. So it was two distinct bands of uh, deciduous forest belt, which were the last kind of timber lines before uh, the US grasslands started that extended all the way up to the Rocky Mountains. So this was a really important kind of distinct feature um, for settlers coming and, and pops up on a lot of old maps. You also have the Blackland Prairie um, represented here, which as we know, uh, is such a special ecosystem because it is North America's, one of North America's most endangered large ecosystems. Um, they estimate that about 98% of this habitat has kind of been um, destroyed or degraded. So one out of every three of these Blackland Prairie species is considered endangered. And that represents 125 species of greatest conservation need of plant, reptile, and mammal. So it's a very special kind of ecosystem to, to learn about and know about so that we can do our job in protecting and restoring it. Also represented is the Lampasas Cut Plain, which uh, is kind of referred to as having characteristics that are very similar to the Edwards Plateau, kind of extending up um, into North Central Texas. You also have your Fort Worth Prairie for people that have been to Tandy Hills Natural Area. Um, it's a great example of a Fort Worth Prairie, and I really recommend you guys go and check that out. So these the vegetational areas have a very intimate tie to their soils and what is underneath them. So you guys can kind of see a crudely represented uh, representation of our soil types. So we're gonna have our caliche limestones here on the left, our blackland clays, as well as um, the cross timbers and post oak savanna sands. You have your really iron rich red sands and your post oak kind of savannas type soil, which is that coarse blonde sand there. So coming to, you know, back to this big picture of the abiotic factors that really shaped this area. These are the non-living conditions that influence and affect our ecosystem. And so we're gonna look at the geology, climate and weather that uh, influence this area of Texas. So as I mentioned in our soil types here, they're very closely uh, related to our ecoregions. So you can see in our soil type here, the Blackland Prairie in yellow, the two bands of cross timbers are in green and the Grand Prairie here in yellow again. So soil really comes from our ge geologic underpinnings and what's going on below soil level and the rocks that those soils are going to come from. So going way back to plate tectonics and the kind of movements that happened underground that really ended up shaping um, the topography of Texas. Uh, side note, <clears throat> I love these maps. You can get them on Etsy that show kind of the relief of Texas. I give them to people as gifts all the time. So um, if you guys can see here in North Central Texas, there's kind of this distinct band going on. And we're going to talk briefly about what happened in our geologic past. So 300 million years ago, during the Pennsylvanian period, uh, Texas was a part um, of the collision of Africa, South America, and North America into the continent of Pangaea. And this collision ended up um, shooting up a mountain range here. Um, that was also the Wichita's and the Appalachians, but the Oachita Mountains um, became a very, very old mountain range in Texas that ended up eroding for 300 million years. So this erosion um, kind of spilt out on either side. And these kind of deposits from the erosion of this mountain range created the really deep oil and gas kind of uh, layers that Texas is so famous for. And the reason why that's relevant to us is that is where our kind of 
iron rich, highly oxidized soils come from, the erosion of that mountain range. So these are very distinct soils in North Central Texas and I always wondered what formed them. Um, another big factor in our geologic past was that Texas, uh, as well as most of the North American continent, was under shallow ocean during the Cretaceous period. Uh, I, I want to point out on this map this kind of blotch of green here because that will become relevant later. So the erosion and, um, of these shallow seas in Texas is really what laid down our, our fossilized kind of limestone soils. And so in this area of Texas, we can go to Dinosaur Valley State Park to see uh, dinosaur footprints in these shallow kind of areas, as well as Mineral Wells Fossil Park is covered in um, ammonites and limestone kind of soil deposits and all these shells. And these are really interesting to me because the shells occurred right where these organisms lived. So you aren't seeing stuff that's been washed in or brought in. These are where these creatures lived out their life. So a fun opportunity to take kids to um, mineral wells and really have them engage in this portion of our geologic past. Another thing I was really excited to learn about this area uh, is Possum Kingdom Lake and Palo Pinto County is part of the oldest rock formation in all of Texas. So, these rocks are part of the Pennsylvanian age, which are 300 million year old rocks. So if we come back to uh, this map of the shallow oceans, here this portion of Texas is going to be where some of those rocks existed. And that was gonna be the high grounds of that kind of ancient ocean landscape. Um, out at Possum Kingdom Lake, I've never been, but I hear people really enjoy those uh, Pennsylvanian rocks out there. They have these cliff diving competitions uh, and have a lot of fun with it. I don't know if these are still going on, but I would love to see it if they were. So coming back um, to kind of water in this region. So mostly I know that there are some people I think coming in from Dallas. So that's gonna be your Trinity River system. For us here um, in Erath County is where I'm at right now. Uh, the Brazos is our big river basin drainage. So almost all of our smaller rivers and tributaries are gonna join to the Brazos. If you guys are up in Dallas, that's gonna be more to the Trinity. So this becomes a big factor for us in this region of Texas because um, the Brazos River and, and the sand pans that kind of occurred there create the timbers and the spacing in our post oak savanna. So the sands come from um, the river basin and because of all how quickly water moves away from that soil type, we're gonna have our post oak savanna, which are kind of more depleted of nutrients there. So precipitation in Texas, <laughs> Sorry guys, it's so weird talking to people about uh, these things and not hearing any feedback or seeing faces. Like my dog is like <laughs> roaming around in here and it's like I'm talking to myself. <laughs> oh, we're, we're all hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all talk to me for real. Um, so along with our river basins and our precipitation zones that happen in Texas, as you guys can see, it's kind of a gradient across Texas. You're gonna add an inch of rain um, as you go more eastward to the deciduous forests of East Texas, which get a lot more rain than us. Um, in our area, we have mostly prairies, right? So coming back to the prairies and the way that prairies deal with water. So up in the Panhandle, they have a lot more of the seasonal wetlands and the Playa Lakes. Um, so <clears throat> that's all of our soils dealing with, you know, kind of seasonal rains. Uh, you also have hydric meadows and in the Blackland Prairie, we're lucky to have gilgai um, as well as seeps. So gilgai are super, super interesting uh, factor of prairie ecology that I love. So at one point, our prairies were almost entirely covered in this area of Texas at least um, in Gilgai. So there would be thousands of these kind of shallow pools out on the prairie. And this was a factor of our clay soils that kind of created these depressions. Um, so you have unique species that live there. Um, these crawfish uh, are, are being still recently discovered because 
uh, people really plowed these features under before um, even really learning about these species. So this is the way that the prairie deals with water. And so when you go out and you see a Gilgai prairie, you can go into that at Climber Meadow. Brandon Belcher will show you. I highly recommend going out during a rain event because you can see how all these pools kind of uh, fill up with water. And there's a totally different plant community on the low than on the high. Um, but I really love this feature because because when we do come back to um, kind of fire ecology and how fires also shape the landscape, I believe that you know if a fire burned across this, that um, these areas would be kind of protected for the smaller species and the landscape would kind of uh, burn in a mosaic pattern. So seeps. Um, seeps are really fun. I got to interact with a kind of seep prairie uh, back in Dallas at Crawford Park, you will surprise yourself with seeps. Okay, so uh, a seep is kind of the way that sandy soils, so sandy soils when they are uh, have water during a rain event, hit a clay pan, and that clay pan uh, has smaller particles which doesn't allow the water to drain. So the water kind of moves off across the clay pan and drains. So it's interesting at the end of prairies and stuff, you'll, you'll find a seep where the water kind of is, is, is exposed. And this isn't in our area, I think this is more Eastern Texas, but you will find different plants down there. Um, in Dallas, you'll see a lot of horsetail reed, um, as well as like little ferns living at the end of that seep. And so it's kind of um, a way that you can spot them. But this is a fun video that my brother and um, my ex-boyfriend at the time, took out on our family farm that kind of illustrate the soil type and uh, what you might be dealing with out there. So um, I love that video because it kind of shows how um, the sandy soils on top of a clay pan can come become completely saturated with moisture um, before they have time to run off. And so that's like a really cool illustration of what might be going on. Sorry, next. So all these factors kind of come together to produce um, within our ecosystem, different areas of moisture and topography, even at a micro scale, you know, like this is a landscape scale of hydric, mesic and xeric um, kind of zones. So the xeric area, if you guys have ever heard of like xeric gardening um, is very water con water conserving. So water moves away quickly from the xeric. So you're gonna have a different plant community there as well as the mesic zone, which is your middle kind of area of moisture and conditions. And you also have hydric, which is your low spot where the water collects. And each one of these is gonna create a different plant community. So on our prairies, we can kind of see hydric forbs and grasses, um, bushy blue stem, uh, and sedges as well as rush grasses are really great example of hydric uh, grasses. And then you also have forbs like ironweed and sweet uh, pul pulchella odorata. Um, I always forget that one's common name. Does anyone know pulchella's common name? Not me. Uh, Ricky, do you know? I think I'd call it marsh flea bane. Yeah, there you go. Yay, people. Um, okay, and then we come back to kind of the climate and weather and how our landscape is going to deal with that. So coming back to the big picture, um, the Great Plains were really influenced by um, an effect called a rain shadow, which kind of occurred on the rock because of the Rocky Mountains. So moisture coming in, from either way really, but moisture coming in from coastal zones hits the Rocky Mountains and kind of drops, right? So it kind of prevents moisture from coming across the mountain range. So because of that effect, we're gonna end up with different um, prairie types. You're gonna have your short grass prairie that is kind of more moisture starved, right? A little bit more xeric. 
um, the midgrass prairie um, here in between, and that transitions to the tall grass prairie, which our blackland prairie is lucky to be a part of. Um, that's going to be way more moisture rich um, and have deeper, more organically rich soils. So the short grass prairie in Texas can really be seen in the panhandle more, um, but it, it's kind of indicated by different grass communities, right? Shorter stature, uh, more tolerant of droughts, um, like our state grass, the Cytoats grama. As well as the species kind of exhibited in uh, ladybirds habitat. So you have your curly mesquites, your buffalo grass, and your blue grama. You can see some blue grama here in this West Texas yard. Um, I took this photo, I just really love it. And then you also have your tall grass prairie, which um, the Blackland Prairie is kind of famous for. These grasses will get up to being nine feet tall and have wildflowers throughout the season. The species of the tall grass prairie, as well as you know the short and mid grass prairie in Texas for sure. Um, but big blue stem is here, um, switch grass, little blue and Indian grass. And these would form different types of complexes, depending on conditions and how much moisture, you would get different representations of um, the big four grasses here. Uh, little blue is definitely the most common and kind of dominant climax grass for us. So because of the exposure of the prairie to, to heat and to wind, um, um, coming across the prairie, it's a very connected ecosystem, right? A very uniform ecosystem. So that combined with periods of drought would create very brittle conditions and those conditions would spark fires. So fires were a regular occurrence um, on the prairies. Now, when we're kind of managing land and looking at this, we say maybe every three to five years, but it depends on where you're at. Um, and whether your ecosystem wants to burn for sure. But the people from the past, the pioneers coming to observe this, um, really reported as a regular occurrence, you know, the, it, it would start and you could see it moving across the entire landscape. Of course, Native Americans and the people settling in, in that area really knew how to deal with that and just got comfortable with that as a regular feature of the landscape. Yeah, I love learning about uh, fire ecology too and how people would kind of escape and deal with that. They would find water or expose grounds or um, areas of deep sand where the fire would not come across. So um, for us in the, in the cross timbers, for sure, this created our very adapted uh, post oak, blackjack oak woodlands. Um, this was a fire dependent landscape. Um, Sorry, getting another call. Um, a kind of fire dependent landscape that uh, burned regularly and created that kind of orchard like habit that you hear reported. Um, so, very, it almost looked maintained, you know, there was big spacing in between the trees um, and had low grasses in that kind of savanna habit, as well as wildfires. So, um, the way that, you know, just to illustrate, I guess, uh, how dependent these species are. So when you have a fire adapted landscape, you can kind of look and see, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, fire adapted landscape, you can kind of look and see um, dependency on that fire. So there's seed dormancy um, and species like pine uh, need fire to come through in order for their uh, seeds to germinate. So you have fire dependency in that, in that kind of ecosystem as well. Um, <laughs> Y'all yeah, ask questions and talk to me. I like keep forgetting that I'm speaking to a crowd, it's crazy. <laughs> um, also on the prairie, you have the, the sumax, you know, and I find this picture very interesting. So when fires do come through frequently, it kind of keeps the woody growth in check. So people have a lot of issues with cedar on the prairie, um, as well as sumax, you know, kind of get a bad rap sometimes, um, just because of how kind of aggressive they are. But um, living out 
uh, in Stephenville, where you can see really kind of the big picture of the landscape, I love seeing the sumac colonies kind of growing in these mounds. Um, they have their, their uh, own unique little microhabitat there that I'm sure is great for birds. But um, this is a, uh, if fires did come through, you can kind of see the sumacs are kept at the height of the grasses. Um, so some woody species that are colonial growing um, can handle fire and, and be a part of that landscape in a more balanced way. We do have, we do have a question uh, in the chat window now about uh, how to handle uh, invasive species like Johnson grass. Invasive species like Johnson grass? Chalky, uh, Johnson grass, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, I'll come back to that um, when I talk about grasses in a second, okay? Okay. Yeah, I'll keep them coming. Or if you have any comments, I know that people love or hate sumac, love or hate cedar. Okay, so um, all these fire relationships and, and, or let me go back. So grasses have become very adapted to all the conditions that they have to deal with, the drought, the wind, um, and the fire. And they kind of deal with this by having this unique growth form. So uh, this is lemongrass here, but it kind of illustrates the point of a clumping grass habit. This is distinct to our prairies. Clumping grasses are very, very valuable. So if you have them, conserve them, <clears throat> they're hard to replace. You also have the basal rosettes. So our, for, our forbs will form um, a basal rosette. And that's kind of illustrated here by this Rudebeckia maxima, uh, giant coneflower, I think is the common name. But they'll hunker down in this basal rosette and then they'll kind of wait their turn, wait their season and shoot off their flower head. Uh, but most of the year they wait down in that basal rosette. And in this way, they're able to protect um, basically their resources above ground, you know, so you can kind of think of that, um, yeah, as a form of protection. So if a fire did come through, the wind uh, really pulls moisture out of these plants. This was a way of protecting themselves and also from, you know, grazing pressures as well. Um, but learning more about fire ecology, this kind of clumping habit would really help because fires would basically burn across the top where there's more airflow um, and that kind of more moisture clumping habit would really keep things protected. Okay, how am I doing on time? Okay, I think we're good. So because of all these pressures, our plant community um, in this area really spends a lot of time below ground. So they are, they form some very extensive roots and underground storage systems, um, making our very famous for uh, how deep rooted it is. Um, I always find it interesting that on these maps, the little latrice, the prairie blazing star, is some of the most deep and deeply mining root systems. I think going down to, yeah, well beyond 15 feet deep. Um, also a fun illustration in these maps is our turf grass over here with almost shallow non-existent root systems. Um, and our buffalo grass off to the far right, which you can see is much more deeply rooted. So these roots in a modern context really help with soil erosion. They also are extremely important for uh, water infiltration. So they help bring moisture down um, and prevent runoff and erosion issues. Uh, so we do love the, the prairie root systems. So prairie soils, because um, of all these factors that we've been discussing, um, are very, very deep and organically rich. So you can kind of think of a prairie as being mostly below ground, right? So they kind of have their vegetation portion, but it's really below ground that a lot of action is happening. Prairie soils are very important as uh, carbon sinks. So they actually conserve more carbon than rainforests do um, in all these below ground layers. These are really um, also created by the fibrous kind of root systems and habit of the grasses that really build these along with fire um, and all the other activity that's going on below ground. So I, soil carbon, it's meant to be soil carbon. Uh, soil carbon, um, 
I've kind of like discussed with you. Um, another fun fact that I am really learning more about soil ecology and the microbial relationships there. Um, but a fun fact for you plant people is root exudates. So <clears throat> from these roots, um, all of photosynthetic products of plants, right? So all of the sugars that they make and produce. Of those, 30 to 40% are excreted into the soil. So a plant is taking its livelihood, basically, like its money and all of its value, and it's giving 30 to 40% of that back to the soil. So that is to kind of feed microbial relationships. And, you know, we're learning more every day about how important those, those microbial relationships are to plants. Um, but the microbiome is, is just fascinating and, and um, really important. And another kind of cool thing that I kind of illustrate uh, microbial relationships with, so is, is pollution remediation. So, you know, we think about trees as being such a helpful um, remediator of pollution, but if you pull the tree out and remove it from the soil, it has a 50% reduced capacity at filtering that pollution. So half of that, 50% um, of that work is actually done by the soil microbes and the relationships it has below ground. Uh, Megan, uh, question about the, uh, the roots here. I see really deep roots on uh, these, uh, plants, how, how deep do the grass roots go if they're on like compacted soil? So um, when, <clears throat> that's a great question actually. So definitely to optimize, you know, our kind of grassland roots here, these deep soils were important, but if a plant is on compacted soil, then it kind of spreads instead of going deeply down. Um, but I do believe some of these species like liatris can really mine limestone so they can figure out the crevices and the cracks and the ways down. Um, so they will still form these root systems, maybe not as extensive um, with, you know, how rich the soils used to be um, or how much moisture used to be there. But I think that they always have the capacity to form these. So the more resources they get, the more that they can access water. Um, the deeper and more bountiful those root systems will become. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, keep them coming, guys, because it makes me feel like I'm not in an empty room. <laughs> um, so coming back to this, you know, inputs and outputs of prairie soil. So because of our kind of agricultural revolution in this area, at one point, Dallas was the number one cotton producer in the world. So these deep, organically rich soils were, were a hotbed of agriculture. And we have spent 100 years, 200 years mining them for their resources. So what happens when you pull all this organic matter out of the soil is you're just left with sheet clay. Um, and that's not really helping anyone. I know people in Dallas really complain about the sheet clay kind of soils, but all they need is their organic matter back. So restoration and um, helping these environments return really can be focused back on the soil and the soil relationships and bringing organic matter back to that system. So now we can talk about kind of the biotic factors that emerged on this landscape. The grazers and the animals and the, inf and the insects that um, interacted here. So because of that, that kind of rich situation and all these kind of, these things kind of feed together. And this is an old uh, illustration, I think by Texas Parks and Wildlife of um, prairie ecology. And you can see how many situations are kind of happening below ground. Um, <clears throat> prairie dogs, badgers, uh, all different species, the ground burn, owls, really love this landscape. And earlier this week in my fire ecology class, I was asking about kind of the ground dwelling mammals. And if fire did come across the, that landscape, they would be safe. So they go below ground, they go back into their holes and a fire can burn across that landscape and they're totally fine because of the insulating power of that soil. So yeah, once again, you can see in this map, 
the um, how detailed that soil environment is and how much is going on below ground. When people like look at a grassland, you know, they see just this simple overview of it um, without really looking down into the details there. So we had a lot of ground dwelling mammals such as the prairie dogs, their, their predator and companion, the black footed ferret, as well as many um, ground dwelling um, owls and birds. Um, all these species, especially the black footed ferret, which depends on prairie dogs, are um, really threatened and in an endangered situation now. So the prairies are definitely famous for their grazers. Um, they report that the Great Plains, you know, had a million animals on it and definitely reports from pioneers in our area report seeing herds of thousands of buffalo, um, too many for them to count. Bison, I'm sorry, American bison. So yeah, uh, as far as our grazers go, um, they're kind of broken down into grass eating and forb eating species. So you have your grasses and then you have your, you know, kind of perennials, uh, and, and wildflowers basically, which make up your forb diet. And there's also browsers. So um, grazers that will eat more woody vegetation. So bison, um, pronghorn. Uh, I was excited to learn uh, about pronghorn, which is really more of a West Texas species now, um, ranging into this area of Texas as far back as the 1800s. Um, there were herds here. Pronghorns are North America's fastest land animal. Uh, I believe, does anyone know their mature, their, their uh, speed? Anyone? Pronghorns top speed. Uh, somebody says it's 60 miles an hour. 61 miles per hour. Yeah. So very, very fast land animal. Um, they, they hypothesized because of that top speed that at one point there was a North American cheetah that could also, you know, to push them to run so fast. I also don't know how quickly fires can travel, but that might have been a factor as well, having to escape um, from fires. Uh, and you also have elk. So elk, um, along with bison and a few, of the, few others of these animals were almost entirely extirpated from the state. So they were hunted to local, local extinction um, as far as their populations go. Uh, so elk, I believe, are starting to range back into protected areas of West Texas, um, but they were also a major grass eater and were definitely out here on our prairies um, along with the pronghorns. Uh, White-tailed deer have exploded in populations since other factors uh, like our fire and our grazers have encouraged more woody growth um, on the prairies. They are more of a browsing species. And then not so much here, but at higher elevations, you'll have a mule deer and at the highest elevations, the bighorn sheep. Um, I haven't found any records of bighorn sheep existing in our area, but I just still think they're a really interesting animal. Uh, last time I gave this presentation, someone was telling me, Phil, do you remember where? Uh, that the Audad had escaped? Uh, yes, there are lots of Audads in, in our area that have escaped. Right, right, in Palo Pinto. So yes. I guess... Okay. Uh, from some exotic ranches, all dads have escaped um, out into Palo Pinto area and are like living up there on those those really old Pennsylvanian rocks. <laughs> so I think that the niche definitely is there if they're surviving and doing well. Um, which, you know, is a fun illustrated point that for the most part, for me, like any sort of invasive species problem is because that niche is not being filled by um, the native or the local species. So <clears throat> if we have, you know, like just for example, on the sheep, if, if there's an odd ad issue, um, an exotic kind of, you know, uh, that the bighorn being in that in that niche or something like that would have prevented the occupation. And the same can kind of be said for, for plants in a lot of ways. Um, so our, our grazers in this area definitely kind of met a tragic past. Uh, 
in shoot no i'm gonna forget um when the bison kind of extinction happened so they they were hunted um you guys remember i think it was the 1830s Ooh, 1930s um when we hunted these to almost being completely extirpated from the state and the same thing happened with uh almost all of those wildlife populations and that is why um now you know, Parks and Wildlife was kind of formed to make sure that people weren't hunting these things or putting too much pressure on the landscape. And I think we've really turned around since then and have been really focusing on rebuilding that landscape. So I talk about grazers because they are completely vital to a grassland ecosystem. And I know that there's a lot of fear um, with people with with prairie remnants and native landscapes about having uh, grazers there because they're like, we're trying to conserve these very special places. Um, we don't wanna see them destroyed. But it's really a, a great opportunity and a lesson in management about sustainable grazing because overgrazing and that, that fear of plant death is really a factor of, of um, time, not intensity. So it's the amount of time that the grazer is on that prairie or on that patch of land. So people have been working to develop more sustainable grazing practices. And one of the methods is high intensity rotational grazing. So it moves um, cattle in kind of like a mob grazing, right? In a really concentrated area. Um, they sit on that land, they bring it almost down to zero, right? They eat everything. And then you quickly move them along um, and you allow that landscape to rest in between. And that ends up becoming extremely valuable for, you know, cycling nutrients from, um, and also maintaining kind of like the youthful vigor of the grasslands. Because one of the things that I kind of, you know, saw a lot of when trying to do prairie restoration was the fact that these landscapes were choked out, right? They had so much thatch build up, so much dead material. Um, and that could have been you know, it definitely calls for a fire, right? Because that fire will come through, kind of reset that ecosystem. But then when a fire did come through, the grazers are what maintain it. So they keep it young, they keep it fertile, they keep things cycling. So they definitely have a valuable place in our ecosystems. So what created that pressure, right? Where a huge herd of bison or any of the other grazers are moving quickly across the landscape is of course our predators. And we can take that role um, in our landscapes now, but predators like black bears and mountain lions definitely ranged into this area of North uh, Central Texas as far back as the 1800s. Um, we still see mountain lighting, a rare mountain lion sighting, um, like we dealt with recently, that lipan situation for the people that are local, um, where a guy was accused of being attacked by a mountain lion. And then the one that also recently was killed um, north of Dallas. Um, you also have the red wolf, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with this species, but they are trying to restore their populations in East Texas right now and really struggling. Um, they're finding that it's kind of a hybrid of a gray wolf or a, or a Mexican wolf and a coyote genetics kind of coming together. Um, but I learned today reading more about our ecosystem that gray wolves were also present um, in our area uh, hunting in smaller packs. You also have your lesser predators here, right? The bobcats and the coyotes, which would um, hunt <clears throat> the very plentiful uh, mammals and bird species that existed on the prairie. So I don't know if I have, yeah, I have my grass. So the prairie was home to tons of ground birds and we really struggle with the restoration of these guys, especially quail and um, prairie chickens here. So fun facts, I don't know if you guys, Pretty much everyone knows Sand County Almanac, right? The book. Well, what was your question again? Have you guys read Sand County Almanac? Oh, yeah, I'm sure a lot of us have. Yeah, well, there's another one um, for Texas called The Land of Bears and Honey. Um, I definitely recommend you guys check it out. Um, but there was reports of prairie chickens. Actually, wait, let me come back to that fact. So 
the ground bird ecology that kind of happens on our prey. So this is corn, you know, but it really illustrates a point. So with our clumping grasses and that, and that habit that I kind of described to you guys earlier, it opens up a complete underground habitat, right? There is, you know, the understory of the grassland. So these are where these, these birds and these ground dwelling species really depended on to escape their predators. And in between the clumping grasses would be highways um, of opportunity. So above head, you have your nine foot grasses. Um, you have a lot of predators out there, but these birds are able to escape and hide because of this dense covering of um, this dense canopy of grass. So coming, yeah. Yeah, could you tell us the name of that book again? Was it the the land of what? The land of bears and honey. Bears and honey. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so we're struggling a lot, you know, to restore quail and restore the prairie chicken. <clears throat> and I think like a major factor there is that we don't have that grassland structure that they need um, to really thrive. Also they've unlearned. So they bring, you know, quail in from South Texas and stuff like that, that don't know how to deal with our ecosystems, but a different factor. Um, the land of bears and honey, that fact that I was going to bring up, apparently uh, prairie chickens were so plentiful on the prairie that in like as far back as the 1890s, um, the on the Chicago market, 900,000 prairie chickens were sold every year. 900,000 prairie chickens on just one market. So there were millions of these birds out on the prairie and apparently they were not at all prepared for humans uh, harvesting them. <clears throat> so, um, yes, uh, grasslands, I always kind of, you know, go back and forth with people. Um, grasslands are a climax ecosystem. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen kind of like the successional habit, right? Where it goes from, uh, you know, mosses to grasslands to uh, mature forests. But grasslands are a climax ecosystem. This is beautifully illustrated uh, by gamma grass. It's kind of hard to see, but I did my best with what the internet had available. But gamma grasses will kind of form rings. So the central in individual there in the center, every year kind of has, um, it grows out new shoots and kind of multiplies itself and it starts forming these rings, right? Uh, and they've been able to date the size and the diameter of that uh, grass and, and kind of estimate how old those grasses would be. And they're estimating these grasses are over a hundred years old. So it is an old growth grassland um, and a climax ecosystem, and we should respect it uh, in the way that we respect trees that are hundreds of years old. Um, these species have been here for a very long time and they're very hard to replace. So the value there, um, when, we're, when we're looking at, you know, a prairie that had millions of ground birds, um, it can kind of come back to our own agricultural systems. Um, so my brother, I like telling this story. Um, my brother uh, does sustainable grazing and he worked on a farm in, or a big uh, ranch in Colorado that the state of Colorado was giving thousands of acres to them at a time to do restoration. Um, and they did restoration with agricultural practices. So they would bring in cattle in super high concentration, like I kind of illustrated. Um, they'd bring in cattle and they'd move quickly across the land and eat all that grass. Um, and they would fertilize, right? All that urine, all that manure. And then they would bring in a forb eater, like a goat. And for us, you know, I kind of talked to you guys about all the different forb eating species. The goat would take down all the forbs and same thing, fertilize and everything. And then they would bring in chickens. So a whole flock of ch chickens would move in afterwards and they would eat all the pests and the bugs and they would scratch the soil and um, turn in all that fertility. And they would move off the land and then let it rest. And they were taking desert and restoring it back to a thriving system 
um, with all that organic matter and that grazing system. And it kind of goes back to, you can have restoration and you can have agriculture too. So here's kind of an illustration of that, that um, how they would move those chickens around and replicate that kind of activity on the prairie. We also had a ton of, um, you know, really unique bird species. You have different predators as well as different songbirds. Um, and they really depended on the plant diversity that would occur on our prairies. Um, so for each one of our ecoregions, sorry, uh, each one of our ecoregions are extremely diverse with, with plant species. Um, each, each one has around a thousand different plant species, but in Texas overall, um, I think there's 5,000 or 5,500 um, plant taxa. So these all have a very dependent relationship on um, the different animals out there. <clears throat> Sorry. Any questions, guys? I'll pause and take a breath. Yeah, we did have a question uh, a little bit earlier about when you were talking about the succession and you, you mentioned uh, the, the climax uh, succession. Uh, mm -hmm. So we had a question in the chat window, if you could go into that, we'll explain that a little further. In the chat. Okay, actually, Bill, I'll come back to it because I don't know how to bring up the chat right now. Okay, that's good. I'm almost done and then I'll take the questions actually. <laughs> Just reminding myself that people are out there. Um, so, you know, I always like talking about kind of the different way that even the plants on the prairie succeed. So you kind of start off your wildflower season or kind of going by. Okay, so the prairie is famous for its wildflowers, right? Wildflowers are out throughout the warm season. Um, and there was this really cool fact that on a very healthy prairie ecosystem, two to three new species of plant bloom every day. So there's a lot of excitement going on, something new and different to see every day. And that kind of, the wildflower season is really kicked off with blue bonnets, which is why we get so excited. Um, and I have grape hyacinth here to kind of illustrate the point, but it starts very low and blue. And as the, the season goes on, um, the plants get taller uh, as the grasses do too, right? So. At the beginning of the season, the grasses are very low and you have your early wildflowers. And as the grasses grow and get taller, the plants have to compete with them. So when grasses get to be nine feet tall, how, how tall do our, our fall blooming species have to be? Even taller. So we would have sunflowers and stuff out at Texas Discovery Gardens that um, were fall blooming species that would be like 10 or 15 feet high. Um, and these species definitely really depend on that grassland for structure, right? And I think that's something we all struggle with in native gardening is uh, we all want the wildflowers, but we forget about the grass. And the grass is a support system for all these flowering species. Um, but it's also fun to kind of think about that because if you know, um, you know, like all of our, all sorry, all the fall blooming species are much taller, much more golden. Um, you can kind of expect to see um, how the plant community they would be competing with during time of bloom. Uh, bird species definitely super depend on these seeds uh, for their diet. And this is also extremely important for seed dispersal, um, for the genetics to move throughout the prairie. And wrapping up with the pollinators. So pollinators, also very much so depend on this ecosystem for their migration. This complete corridor of uh, wildflowers was their nectar and their food source. Um, so as we struggle with monarch habitat restoration, really thinking about these prairies and these ecosystems is essential. <clears throat> I won't go too much into pollinator ecology, but um, we can see, you know, with monarchs and, and their relationships with milkweeds, how absolutely dependent these species are on having the right plants in this ecosystem. So without, you know, the, without milkweeds, we're not going to have monarchs. And so one is so intimately uh, related to the other. And that brings me to the specialists. 
So, you know, in any ecosystem, as it gets more and more advanced, it gets more and more specialized. Um, this is perfectly illustrated by orchids. So you know that you have a remnant ecosystem, something that's intact and biologically active if you have orchids. Um, and they have specific pollinators that depend on them and, and, um, and that very intricate relationship. And so you can't really have one without the other. Um, and so we have to conserve these species, right? They're very sensitive. So that kind of comes around um, to those dependent relationships, kind of create those specialized creatures that are at risk when that system is degraded. So you have your species of greatest conservation need and each um, ecoregion has its own um, species, but these are listed by the state and then sometimes federally as being um, endangered and species we really need to protect and care about their habitat. You have the spotted skunk here and the whooping crane, the Texas horn lizard, which we're all um, familiar with that plight, um, as well as the long-tailed uh, weasel as an illustration. And then you also have um, endangered species on the plant list as well. Um, Hall's Dahlia, Guadalupe Penstemon, and Agalinus densiflorus are just small examples of the kind of plants that are lost when um, the ecosystem is degraded. Same thing goes with our post and blackjack oaks um, are very sensitive species to compaction. Uh, so because of those sandy soils and how loose and aerated they were, when we do construction activity of any kind and run over their root systems, uh, they almost completely degrade and decline. So you'll see the death of the canopy as an indicator of the death of the root system. Um, so that is a plant, you know, that its roots are dying, so its canopy are dying. And post and blackjack oaks uh, are very, very sensitive to that. So all in all, we have a very complex ecosystem in North Central Texas here. Um, a lot of beautiful species, and I really encourage you guys to go out and explore and see remnants to see what this ecosystem is possible. Um, it experienced some very serious decline uh, due to agriculture and urbanization um, because it was such a fertile and beautiful place that we kind of exploited in our past. But it has persisted in a lot of ways and in a lot of places um, despite that urbanization. And there's a lot of um, hope for recovery there. For the two things to kind of coexist and the people out there doing the good work like the Native Plant Society and Master Naturalists that um, are really intent on restoring this ecosystem back to its full health um, and a ton of possibility. So we're coming into a time where we really do get to decide, you know, now that we reached a point <laughs> kind of ground zero of restarting again, where we want things to go and what we want to encourage. I love this quote from a book called Planning in a Post-Wild World by Claudia West that I super highly recommend. Um, but it talks about nature as it was and nature as it could be. Um, you know, in the US we've experienced so much habitat destruction but the, the author, Claudia West, she comes from, you know, areas of the Soviet Union where things were just, you know, like in the Chernobyl kind of situation, things were eliminated and nature was destroyed. And her whole life experience has been seen at return and all the things that it's capable of. So the two authors kind of have these like uh, contrasting perspectives and they, they come to this point of like, well, what, what can it be going forward? And I think that's a really helpful message. So I think there's a ton of opportunity, of course, to do restoration on private lands, um, as well as in public parks. There, there is a place for all these things. Uh, prairie grasses are so water conservative. We don't need to be mowing our parks like crazy and, and drenching them in water throughout the summer. It's a so much more enjoyable landscape when there's something to discover out there. Um, so a place in public parks and also in our yards. This is a, a fall winter prairie um, against this urban setting. And I think it's, it's kind of awesome. So yes, 
Thank you, the end. I hope you guys are still out there. We're still out here. Uh, yeah, that was that was wonderful and a wonderful presentation. And I have to comment that you have a you have really good slides, also really oh. great pictures in the slides. And <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, any other comments? Uh, or uh, we've got a lot of a lot of uh, in the chat window. There's a lot of. Uh, praise or great pictures, well-organized, wonderful. Uh, and um, fascinating. Uh, maybe you could uh, uh, explain the climax uh, uh, of the succession again, if, if you, we did yeah. have that question. Um, okay, what was the climax succession? I still can't figure out how to see the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll just read it to you. It, it's uh, Karen uh, asked, uh, please explain uh, climax uh, system. I think she's talking about succession. The climax. Yeah. So this is really interesting because, you know, whenever people are trying to do restoration on their land, it's funny because they always go to the highest quality species, right? They go straight to the climax species, which actually require a lot of things to be happening before they can be there. Um, soil fertility in the right kind of conditions. I know, Bill, that you had that experience with big blue stem out on your property. Yes, that's right. I did have, uh, I planted some blue, big blue stem long, long, long ago, and I disappeared completely or so I thought and then after we had uh, a lot of a lot more than average rain recently I, I just happened to be walking across that part of my property and I I saw this really tall plant over there and I thought you know that sort of looks like big blue stem and that and that's sort of where I remember planting it <laughs> like years, 10 years ago or something <laughs> So, um, you know, I love the succession model because there's a lot of species that kind of exist in between um, climax and ground zero. So ground zero is exposed soil. So tilling, um, tilling practices disturb soil, right, and kind of reset everything to ground zero. So if we're trying to conserve these kind of species, that's what we want to avoid. We really don't want to have any tilling practices. Um, but, you know, species move in afterwards and, and as conditions and, and uh, organic matter and microbial relationships are restored to the system, then it moves up, you know, into succession. So <clears throat> if I have like a more degraded situation, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick little blue stem for being a trooper, right? Um, it can handle more shallow soils and a little bit less moisture. So restoring uh, little blue is, you know, kind of a, a good ground zero. And then you can layer in that Indian grass and the big blue and other high quality forbs um, that are really, you know, valuable. But there are definitely some fighters out there that like if you're starting at ground zero are great species to put in um, that will help you move your prairie along. Good question. We do have another question here from Lois about uh, uh, what are the what are some of the endangered plants of the Plaquemine Prairie, and where can you get uh, a resource that would tell you what the endangered plants are in the Plaquemine Prairie? Yeah, um, so I look them up online. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, if you go to their kind of species of greatest conservation need um, page, then you can actually download Excel files of all the species that are listed federally and by state and by region. So you can kind of, you know, I just did a very brief um, few species here and there, um, but there, there's quite an extensive list and things to look out for. Uh, I highly recommend using iNaturalist so that people really know about populations um, and where these kind of things are occurring. Because I think that there are more remnants um, and more hidey holes where these valuable species are still surviving today that scientists just don't know about. You know, you can, if you stop sharing the screen, I think you can actually see the chat window. Okay, perfect. I have a question about fire. You've talked about fire frequently. How often or, or 
controlled burns, how frequently are they done? Yes. Um, so control burns, it's going to totally depend on your ecosystem for sure. So um, what kind of community you have and also the situations that are happening there. But on average, I think it's recommended every three to five years is when, in, when a prairie ecosystem would kind of burn regularly. Um, as far as how many prescribed burns we are doing to the landscape, the answer is not enough. It's just not enough. So I, I do think you can burn too much. Don't get me wrong. Some people really kind of overcorrect and want to burn every year. They get really burn happy. Um, and you can see the ecosystem kind of getting more stressed when that happens, right? Those root systems get kind of depleted and um, the vegetation gets thinner. But uh, it's definitely a restorative practice and really great. Um, you kind of can go out and look at your landscape and understand if it needs to burn. So if you're talking prairies, um, any kind of woody vegetation and encroachment um, is a good indicator like cedar that the ecosystem's not burning enough. And you also have thatch buildup. Um, so thatch is dead material in the grasses and that really ends up choking out the ecosystem. And then of course you have weather conditions and weather patterns that make that ecosystem very fire prone. Um, so prolonged periods of drought and um, hot weather, like you know conditions of 2011 that led to, I believe a, a big fire in Palo Pinto State Park and also in Bastrop, um, but just extreme conditions that will light that. And then the ecosystem that's been waiting to burn for way too long, um, goes up in flames, like, you know, California wildfires that are completely out of control just because of how much fuel is there. So who would be in charge of those burns? Is that Fish and Wildlife, the Army Corps of Engineers, the local counties? Is there a state department? Who does that? Okay, so this is an area I'm still really learning about, but Texas Parks and Wildlife does do some work in that. Um, you can talk to your local fire department about your area's kind of rules. And a lot of times they'll come out um, to do fire training, wildland fire training, um, and supervise a burn and help you with it. Um, <clears throat> but you also need to find like a local expert. Um, I know who does that at Tarleton, but you know, your area might be um, specific to you. Thank you. I feel like I didn't take a breath during that entire presentation. <laughs> hey, Megan, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, there was a question asked about Johnson grass earlier. Uh, and Johnson. you could talk about how much you love pulling that up. Yeah. Um, so like I mentioned with the invasive species that I, I kind of have, you know, a theory that the invasive will tell you what's missing, right? So based on the habit of Johnson grass, um, I would say switch grass is really like your, your bigger grasses are missing from that ecosystem, right? That niche is available. So competing with Johnson grass, like the first thing I do is like, you know, switch grass is, it, it's almost identical to it. So um, as you are doing removal, which is a pain in the butt, don't get me wrong. Um, whether you are suppressing that with, with just getting after it with mowing aggressively um, or uh, you know mechanical removal, replacing that with the plant community that will compete best with it is going to help you keep that under control. So, <clears throat> so much during like invasive species removal, we're creating a void in the ecosystem, right? We're taking something out, but we're not replacing it with anything. Um, so I think having a plan is very important when you are doing invasive species removal. There has to be the component of removal and there has to be a compo component of replacement. Does thatch help provide organic matter to the soil? Um, thatch does help provide organic matter to the soil if it was in contact with the soil. So that ends up becoming the issue, right? Like thatch is held in the canopy and that's almost tied up and not doing anything for the ecosystem. So burning through that or, you know, even mowing to some degree returns everything back to ground level where it really can de decompose and um, 
fertilize that soil. So thatch is great if you burn it or if you can get it back on the ground. It does add nutrition and um, as long as it's part of that nutrient cycle. And Lois wanted to know uh, what we, you would suggest as a replacement plant for honey locust trees. Actually, you know, <laughs> so I was learning a lot um, about the woodies in this area. Like oaks are definitely preferred by all of us, right? But um, honey locust was a natural component in the landscape as well, along with the bodark and mesquite. Um, honey locust does not like being cut. So I always really recommend um, if you do, <laughs> this is kind of complicated, right? There are mother, there are mother trees. Um, the oldest tree you have out on your landscape is your mother tree. And if you cut that, <laughs> the root system will just completely sprout babies, right? And then these things are gonna be like popping up all over your system. Um, so I actually recommend keeping your mother trees um, because that kind of, you know, keeps things in control. But yeah, honey locust is a hard one to get rid of once you do that. Um, but cutting after it, cutting it and getting after it consistently in one year and before it produces any seed is really important to controlling that in your landscape. So it'll be a pain in the butt, but like you'll probably have to go out there and, and hack or pull those things out, you know, um, three times in one year and that should control the issue. Well, what about, uh, and Lois followed up with her questions more about honey locust trees, about uh, whether if you had a controlled fire, could that uh, get rid of those? Honey locusts, yes. Yeah, that will really help. So controlled fire is also, you know, a great one, like for any woodies out on the prairie, um, they really didn't like fire and they didn't like grazers. Um, something interesting, you know, I've been learning too from my brother who does work with bison, um, that the bison will really rub up against cedar trees um, to cover themselves basically like an insecticide, right? Those volatile compounds um, will protect them from insects and repel insects. And so there are certain species that we have an issue with now because they were under such pressure in the past. Um, so pressure by the grazing animals, pressure by fire. We just got to kind of figure out what's that missing link. For everyone else still on here, I'm sorry if that was so fast. <laughs> There's a lot to cover. You know, I never know how much detail to go into any one thing, but ecology is such an interacting web of all these features. Here's something that uh, we missed uh, from uh, Rachel. She uh, commented that uh, mentioned the author Jan Reed. I don't know if you're familiar with Jan Reed, but uh, she wanted to know about what evidence there was that uh, humans can competently serve the role of predator instead of having natural predators in the environment. Have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I definitely do think that's a bit of a philosophical question. Um, but, you know, I truly believe, I mean, humans have been a part of the landscape for hundreds of thousands of years. So um, I think we do have a predator role and a predator relationship with the, with the landscape for sure. I don't, I don't believe myself that we can completely replace all other predators. Um, there's a total hierarchy and, uh, you know, chain of creatures that exist especially, you know, for like small mammals and stuff, like <clears throat> when it comes to mice and rat populations, like the smaller and lesser predators are so important for that control. So I don't think that we could ever replace that, um, you know, intricate system that evolution has developed, you know, like I think the natural system is best, but humans definitely do have a role there. Uh, let's see, we got some more questions down here. Uh, somebody wanting to know if you would be willing to do a consultation on a, uh, a small property. Yes, I'd love to. Actually, I love doing that kind of stuff on the weekends. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know if I've listed my email here, but it's just my name, Megan Peoples 
at gmail.com or you can find me on Facebook and send me um, a Facebook message. Well, I think that was really, really wonderful presentation. And I think we, we've all enjoyed it. And uh, so uh, uh, really want to thank you for coming today, uh, Megan. And Thank you guys.